Yo, yo, yo. Hey guys, welcome back to another awesome, awesome, awesome edition of the Best Practices Show podcast. My name is Kirk Barron. We have one goal, to bring you the best minds in dentistry, to bring you some best practices to help you improve your practice and your life. And today, we do exactly that with two of my greatest heroes in dentistry, Bill Robbins and Jim Otten. Nuff said. They are awesome human beings and incredible dentists, fantastic teachers. And today they talk about how to treat the five most difficult patients. They are the brilliant minds behind global diagnosis education. And they're going to be doing their annual symposium here in Milwaukee on September 9th and 10th. Don't miss it. So check out the episode. I know you'll love it. And we'll see you soon. Welcome back to the Best Practice Show podcast. I feel like a kid in a candy store. You know what I get to do? I get to hang out with really cool people and they're friends of mine and they're brilliant. And if you've ever met me personally, you know, I don't really know a whole lot. And this is a great tip for you. Just surround yourself with really smart people that are awesome and they make your life better and they speed up your mistakes in some cases. And they also like just make the world a better place. And you're going to see that today with two of my dear friends. You know, I've got um, Bill Robbins and Dr. Jim Otten. Well, Dr. Bill Robbins and Dr. Jim Otten. Gosh, listen to me. Who have not only been great mentors of, of mine, and I knew them both before, back when I did have hair, and now I don't. And um, today we're going to be talking about a very important subject. If you're a dentist, I don't care if you're a dental student. I don't care if you're a new dentist. I don't care if you're an established dentist, or even if you're just trying to slow down, you've got some difficult cases that come in your office that make you scratch your head. And you're like, mm, this one's going to be interesting. And there's nobody better than these two guys to help us solve that. So thank you guys for being on. How are you? We're great. It's good to be with you, Kurt. As always, it's good to be with you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm doing fantastic now. My day was good. It's even better now. This is, I get to hang out with you guys. This is awesome. Yeah. And so, like, I got a bone to pick with both of these guys because now these guys are my heroes. I want to be them someday. Every time I get a video or a FaceTime from them, they're like on the side of a mountain in another country, just kind of enjoying themselves, you know, and because it's all about having fun and with people that, that matter. And so uh, if you guys listen very carefully, you're going to see how sharp these guys are, but I want to do a small intro. Um, so everybody knows who you, who they're listening to, because we do have a lot of young, we got dental students listening now. And so who's Bill Robbins and who is Jim Otten? Jim Otten first. <laughs> so my path has been one that's been rather circuitous but I've been at this now for about 40 years, which is long enough to know better and long enough to understand some things. And my path you know, went through a lot of uh, ups and downs and twists and turns, buying a practice in 1981 and trying to develop that practice in my own style, in my own personality, and with things that brought me joy. And so, I've been at this for a long time now, and I'm, I've got more sunlight behind me than I do in front of me. And so as that ha a progression has occurred and has manifested itself, I feel like I'm able to kind of crystallize my knowledge in things like TM joint problems and, and airway disorders and apply that to the restorative process. And that's been sort of my focus of the uh, last uh, decade or so of my career. And I'm just, like you said, Kirk, I'm privileged to be here. I'm privileged to be able to learn from people like both of you who have been absolutely inspirational in my life. And, and I would not be here if it wasn't for the people whose shoulders I stand on because it, it just has to happen that way. And if there's all those young dentists that are out there and just coming out of dental school, there's only one thing you should take from this is that you need people like Kirk Barron and Bill Robbins in your life too. Well, very kind of you, buddy. 
All right. Well, I, I will echo that. I mean, we're all products of those great people that um, saw something in us that we didn't see in ourselves. And I've been the benefit of that many times over my career. Um, I'm almost at it for 50 years. The first 25 years of my career, um, I was an academic guy. Um, I primarily ran AGD and GPR programs at three different venues. I ran one in the VA, one in the Air Force, and one at the dental school in San Antonio. <clears throat> and after doing that for 25 years, I decided I wanted to live on the other side of the track. And so I left academics, at least full-time academics, and went to full-time private practice. And that's where I've been for the past 24 years. And so I've been blessed to live on both sides of that world. And that is the academic side and the private practice side. And I've loved both of them and each are difficult in their own ways and it's made for a very rich life. And so that's what I bring to the mix, a little bit of academics and a little bit of private practice and a lot of rock and roll. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And you're going to see these are th these two amazing men are the brilliant minds behind global diagnosis education. And I'm just saying this, if you're a young dentist, you're looking for a great system, a great way to think about treatment planning and treating difficult patients. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful. So we're going to be talking about this and you guys actually have your global diagnosis education annual symposium. First one of the annual uh, it's going to be annually. It's going to be here in Milwaukee. We're going to talk about that. And it's going to be on September 9th and 10th at the end. So if you want to check it out, there's a link in the, in the bio uh, down in the show notes and you'll be able to see all that. But uh, Bill, take us through this. When you were talking about treating the difficult patient, what does that mean? And why is that so important? You know, I want to talk a little bit about our partnership first, Jim and I, uh, briefly, because it really matters to our story. Um, Jim and I have been friends for a long time and we had a dream um, or at least a vision five, six years ago. And we actually got together to talk about it because we were both coming to that stage in our careers when we were about to, to retire, at least sell our practices and slow down. And we both we felt like we had something to share, but we weren't sure how to do it. And so we talked about it, we brainstormed, but we never got it off the ground. And then COVID hit. And um, you were the visionary that started the COVID release conference and you asked Jim and I to be involved in it and we were. So for that 10 weeks that you were providing five hours of CE five days a week, um, Jim and I were there much of that time. And during that time, we both gave lectures on it. And we also um, were, were people that facilitated some of the speaking and asking questions and all. And during that time, both of us had FaceTime with people from around the country that we'd never met before. And based on that and our lectures, um, we had a following of people that before didn't know either of us. And so it was at this time, at the end of the COVID relief conference, we both got a vision that this is the right time to start a virtual study club, online study club. And so we did. So we started um, Global Diagnosis Education Study Club uh, a little over two years ago, June of 2020. And we've been meeting ever since. And Jim and I knew each other fairly well and we had some sense about the skill set that the other brought, but I don't think either of us really understood how great the synergy was going to be between us. I certainly didn't have that vision. And as we started to grow the study club together, it became very obvious that I brought a skill set to diagnosis and treatment planning, and he bought a skill set related to function and occlusion and TMD, which I didn't bring. And our circles, we, we had the a similar practice. We both have an interdisciplinary type practice and we both have practiced dentistry in an interdisciplinary way for all these years. And our practices have been very parallel. However, we have different skill sets and it turned out that it was a marriage made in heaven. And it became obvious, I think in the first six months that this was, uh, you know, this was like a God thing that we came together to create this study club. And so we've been doing it now for more than two years. And, um, it's been among the most, if not the most favorite of my educational ed experiences, situations of my career. So I'm, I'm yammering on Jim, you, you talk a little bit about it. <laughs> well, I, I echo everything you said, you know, and like I said before, you know, we, we, when we collaborate with other people, with other people with great minds and have great skill sets that we don't have, you know, the synergy is, is, is contagious. And, and that's what really brings us, brings us all together. It's what makes everything move in the right direction and, and you know, 
forces us to develop ourselves and to really understand who we are, what we have to offer and what we can give back to people. And I think that, you know, like you said, a great teacher sees something in you, you don't see in yourself. Well, we keep pushing each other to see that. Uh, and we keep challenging each other to see that. What, what about uh, diagnosis? What about joint problems? What about sleep? How does this all integrate? And this community we've built is just terrific. I mean, the interaction with us and the people on the platform is, is just the thing that brings us you know, great joy. Uh, I, I, I've had experience teaching in, in some of the, the best centers in dentistry at the Pankey Institute, Spear Education, other places. And, and this helps us pull it all together. It helps us take that information that people have and really, really merge it together. So we're going to talk a little bit about the difficult patient. I think the first thing we have to decide is what's a difficult patient? Is it difficult technically, behaviorally, you know, financially, all of the above, you know, and and uh, and really see how we we bring our skill sets together to help know when the right time is to treat and when it's not, and how to go about doing doing things in ways that benefit every you know everyone involved. Yeah, let me, can I say two things before we get started? Because you guys are being a little humble here. So I'm going to brag about you. You know, I heard somebody say this a long time ago, and you guys have been listening to the podcast. You're, you're not really a great leader until you create other great leaders that ultimately create other great leaders. And that is exactly what you guys are doing. You guys are brilliant teachers, but your heart is set at such a beautiful place that you're developing these wonderful leaders in dentistry who are now solving complex problems and then they're ultimately going to pass along the legacy, you know, that you guys started, which couldn't possibly be any more fulfilling, I'm guessing. Um, and then can I introduce a second thing before getting, you know, and you guys can speak to this and it speaks to like one of the most fulfilling pieces you find in dentistry is as you solve problems, you start to get presented more complex problems. And there's so much fulfillment in these problems coming to you and now you put the pieces of the puzzle together true true absolutely true and, and you know in, in bill in the restorative space his his system he's developed over the last 20 years and the global diagnosis protocols have, have simplified the complex and, we're, and we try to do that with all everything we teach and you're exactly right it it, it becomes so much more fulfilling I would say, you know, to my students, anybody can do the easy ones, you know, right? That's, that, there's nothing to that. But to work with people, to establish relationships with your patients that are really meaningful relationships that can help them solve complex problems that they have carried with them for sometimes decades. Two patients today, two new patients today, just now, um, when I started talking to them about the issues they brought to the table, the issues they bring to the practice, brought them to tears because it's been so impactful in their life as we started to open up and say tell me a little bit more about this problem and this problem and you know and it's been so it's emotionally impactful for these people when you can unwind that kind of stuff whether it's aesthetic or, or facial pain or sleep problems it's amazing i you know i don't care if i ever fix another tooth again <laughs> you know really <laughs> yeah it's awesome and i'll also say this you know your goal is never to like build an amazing, I mean, you, you, you can, you build an amazing business. Of course, it's one of your goals, but like, cause solving complex problems, if you're a dentist listening, you're like, I don't know how I'm ever going to get out of PPOs. There's so much, this is one of the fastest ways out because at the end of the day, somebody has got to come to you because you're good at something and they got to reach in their pocket and use the money that they've earned to say, I need your help at some point. So this is one of the most beautiful places in dentistry to have this conversation because there's so much fulfillment on all levels. But Bill, kind of guide us here when you talk about like thinking about this the right way, how do we think correctly about treating the difficult patient? All right, so this is where it came from. Um, as I said, Jim and I have been, we talked a lot during the first 18 months of our study club experience when we'd meet on Wednesday evenings. And over the last 18 months, our goal has been for us to talk less and listen more and do more interdisciplinary treatment planning where the members of our community present treatment plans. And so that's kind of where we've gone through the year, last two and a half years. Uh, People that are members, some of our members may be watching this, I don't know, but people that are members of our study club know what Jim and I bring. And I'm the tooth guy and he's the head guy. And so I'm very comfortable talking about teeth and microns and megapascals. I'm very comfortable with that. But when you get off in the touchy-feely stuff, it's a little less comfortable for me. 
So if you ask the two of us to show up and give a talk, he's going to be talking on Sunday morning and I'm going to be talking on Monday morning because we bring different skill sets to the brotherhood that we have. So I wanted to go outside my comfort zone a little bit um, for the presentation I'm going to do at Symposium, September 9th and 10th. And each, he and I each have about 45 minutes to talk. And the goal was to say something we hadn't already said. And we said a lot. So finding something new to say was a bit of a challenge to me. And so I came on the idea of my experience, my almost 50 years of treating patients and that handful that I failed on, essentially failed on for one reason or another. And I started looking back and it was an interesting um, experience for me. I've done this in the last four months. I've created this lecture and it's really been interesting because there's sort of a lot of highs and lows go with it. When I went back and started, I, I picked out the patients that fit into the categories I wanted to talk about. And when I looked at the notes I'd written, it all came rushing back. And a lot of it was negative emotions associated with some of these patients. And so um, it's been an interesting process going through it. So I came up with fives. So clearly there's more than that. But what I'm gonna talk about is five different patients in my practice and how I have dealt with the difficult patient over all these years. And to some degree, how I've evolved. We would all hope that we get better uh, a little later in our career at dealing with these patients. <clears throat> so this is kind of an evolution for me. And I know Jim has had a very similar evolution. So the first patient that I'm going to talk about briefly is the one that I figure out ahead of time is a whack job, or at least that I can't meet their expectations. And the older I get, I'm not great at this, but I'm better than I used to be at reading the red flags. Yeah. And so I talk about a patient that came to me and I talked to her quite a number of times before I finally let her know that I wasn't the one for her. I didn't believe I could meet her expectations and that um, I asked her to seek treatment somewhere else. And she asked me about a referral. And one thing I do not do is refer a wacky patient to one of my friends. It just doesn't make any sense. And so one of the real nice fallbacks that we have, Jim and I have, is we're general dentists. And one easy fallback as a general dentist is to say, Mrs. Jones, I'm sorry, I just don't believe I've got the skill set to meet your needs. And that, you know, I'm not saying whether it's emotionally meet them or technically meet them. I'm just saying I don't have the skill set. And they can't really argue with that. I mean, there's not much to say when a dentist says, I, I'm not the one for you. I don't have the skill set to treat you. So that's the first person I'm going to Wait, let me ask you about that because I got to ask you. So on each one of these, and I was talking to you about this yesterday, how important is it to say no as you mature in your career? How important is that word? Because if you're a young dentist and you're 32 listening, you say yes to everything. You say yes to the crown on Saturday night. You know, yes, I'll come into the office on Sunday. Yes, I can do all of this. Oh, well, do, we have a, do we have another, can we, can we, do, can we do a whole nother podcast on the times I didn't say no when I should have? <laughs> yeah, that that would be a good time. one. <laughs> that's an hour in itself. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead, Bill. No, you go ahead. You, you go ahead. I mean, the whole idea about being able to say no is not one of my great strengths, but I have gotten better at it. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, taking that to a different level and my perspective is that we want, we are, we're seekers and we're healers and we want to help everyone. You know, we really want to help everyone. And we've got to realize that, that we, our, our skill sets are limited, no matter how talented, educated, developed experience we are, we all still have limited skill sets. And, and, and really putting that, you said that so beautifully, Bill, how, how you, you think about that, whether it's a behavioral skill set, a psychological skill set, a technical skill set, they're all limited. And we've got to know ourselves well enough to say, this isn't something that I could be comfortable doing my best. I always right. had a rule. If I couldn't do it as well as in the, in the technical part, if I can't do it as well as a specialist can do it, I'm not going to do it. Right. I'm not yeah. going to do I stink at endo. I always stunk at endo. I could never do endo right. I'm, I'm, after about three or four of them, I said, no way. I'm not doing that. That was just one little boundary in the technical part, but there's a lot of boundary we have to set and we've got to know ourselves to do that. Love it. Love it. So take us through number two. What's the uh, number second? Two, number two is 
Um, another fairly straightforward situation. I've done my share of anterior porcelain in the last 40, 50 years, and actually a lot of it porcelain veneers. And those of you who've done your share of porcelain veneers know that on occasion, you try in the veneer without medium behind it, and they look like a million bucks. They're bright and they're beautiful. You then put um, some type of try in medium and the color of the tooth comes through and the value drops, and all of a sudden they look much less bright and grayer than they did without the medium. So I've had my share of patients over all these years where I've tried in that set of veneers and with the try in pace before I show them to the patient and with try and pace, you don't have to worry about the light setting it up so they can look at these veneers and brighter light. And I'm sitting there and I know the values drop too much. They're not as bright as the provisionals. And there's a part of me going, there's the angel sitting on my shoulder right here going, <laughs> don't put them in. They're not bright enough. The patient's not going to like them. Don't do it. Don't do it. And then over here's the devil whispering in my ear, ah, put them in. They'll be fine. They, they won't know the difference. You got three hours marked off. This is your whole production for the week. If you don't put them in, your wife's going to be angry when you get home. Put them in. They'll be fine. All right, so I've got this thing going on in my head, and I don't have a lot of time to make the decision, and I've made both decisions. I've been smart enough on occasion not to put them in, and other times I've put them in, all right? So the second patient is the one where I put the veneers in. The value's too low. They call back tomorrow. They go home thinking they're great, but they call back the next day, and they tell the front office, um, I, I'm not happy with the veneers. All right, I need to speak with Dr. Robbins. And so I don't do any of this by phone. It's got to be done in person. Yeah. And so I say, okay, bring them in. So I already know the patient's unhappy. My standard line when I'm seeing a patient that I know is unhappy is I say to them, before we get started, Mrs. Jones, may I say something before we get started? And she goes, sure. She's sitting here like this because she knows I'm going to fight with her about the veneer. And I say, I know you've thought a lot about this over the last 24, 48 hours. And here's the deal. I promise you that I'm going to listen to what you say because I know you've thought a lot about it and I'm going to do whatever I need to do to make you happy at the end, all right? And that defuses all of the anxiety in the room. Then I ask what's wrong. And she says, I don't like them as much as the provisionals. They're not as bright. And I knew that she's right. They're not. And so I look her in the eye and say, you're absolutely right. Let's walk up front. Let's make another appointment. I'm going to have to remove them, make a new impression, but we'll do that. And I know it's the right thing. And clearly there will be no charge to you. Is that okay? So the second patient is the one that I see what needs to be done. And I just do it. All right. It's no fun, but if you do anterior dentistry, you're going to cut some of your own anterior dentistry off. It is part of the deal. So that's the second. Yeah. Patient. <laughs> yeah. So what like last week I had to. <laughs> so you don't want to throw anything into this. This one's easy too. You knew it wasn't quite right and you put it in anyway. So yeah. what do you do? You cut it off. All right. Yeah. That's the second patient. The third patient is the more difficult one. And the one I've probably had to deal with the most. And that is when they call up and say, I'm not happy. And I didn't expect it. I thought they looked like a million bucks and they don't. So the patient comes back in, they start, telling me what they don't like. I say, I want to know each thing. I'm going to write them down. And the problem is, is when they are unhappy with the results, sometimes they know why and sometimes they don't, but I can't see it. And that's when I think the difficulty occurs. And that's the problem. That's the patient that's unhappy with something that I can't improve by removing it and doing it over again. So my classic way of dealing with this is to say, Mrs. Jones, I just don't see what you're saying. And if yeah. I don't see it, I can't fix it. So you remember I told you ahead of time that I would do whatever I needed to do to make you happy. So I'm asking you, what can I do to make you feel good about this appointment? So I'm putting it back in her lap. And if she says, you know, I just am never going to be happy with these restorations. I just don't like them. And if I, in my heart, don't think I can beat it, that's when I have to go to the last step, which is I told you I'd do what I needed to do, and I don't think I can do better myself. Therefore, I'm going to ask you to go to another dentist. 
and I'm going to ask you to get another opinion and get a treatment plan. And once you get a treatment plan and fees to redo this dentistry, then you let me know, you send it to me and that I'll speak with the dentist and I will reimburse the dentist for the dentistry that he or she does for you. All right. That all sounds good on paper. It's never worked for me because mm -hmm. people do not want to go to another dentist and get a check sent to the dentist. They want the check back themselves. Right. So in my experience, and it hasn't happened many times, but I have written a number of checks through the years, a few checks through the years, and it's painful because there's been times in my life when that was literally the profit from my practice that month that went out in one check back to a patient. And deep down, I know that there's a pretty good chance that they're going to buy their groceries and gas with that money. And they're going to be living with my veneers for the rest of their lives. But the good news is, is that that patient is out of my life and I'd never have to see him again because they signed a waiver, which, was the release I got from the malpractice company when I reported this to have them sign and I no longer have to see them anymore. Yeah. So that's the third patient. The okay. One. couple things. Wait, let me tell you, because if you're a young dentist or if you're like me, you're in a full sweat right now. My hands are sweating right now, Bill, and I'm in a full sweat. This isn't like every day that this is going on. So we're talking about the difficult patients and that's what Bill's going to present at Global Diagnosis Education's Annual Symposium. And here's why this is so important. Nito Cobain used to say this to me all the time. Kirk, it's okay to make a mistake, but when you repeat it, that's when you go crazy. And so what you're learning from these two masters is like, these are things that we have learned the hard way. Don't repeat them. And can you speak to this too? There's a danger of becoming a better restorative complex dentist. There just is. There's higher expectations. Like people don't give you big money and go, ah, you know, just get it close you know, type of a thing, higher fee, higher expectations. It's a different landscape, correct? Oh, for sure. Higher risk, higher risk. The risk is the key. Yeah. It's the risk assessment. That's the key. Can you, can you accept a, an amount of higher risk and, and know how to manage the risk and know how to, how to really articulate that to the patient and, and make it, you know, their choice. If this, then that, you know, uh, if here's the benefit, here's the risk. If we, if you say no to this, then what are you saying yes to, you know, what are the risks involved if we don't do it this way? And you're, you're exactly right. The more complex that you, the more complexity you engage in, especially with, with pain patients, uh, the, the more risk you take on and the, the more clear you have to be. But you know what, and, and this can wrap the rest of it as well. What makes the difference is the relationship you have with that individual. Right. Things don't always go the way you want them to. And everyone yeah. knows. And and in complex cases, one thing can go sideways and and derail the entire experience. Now, hopefully, you know once it starts going sideways, you catch it so you don't you don't miss it too badly. But if you have a good relationship with someone, they understand they're willing to work with you. And, 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 and so, so by and large, these are, these are r relatively rare instances. I mean, Bill's talking about his experience in 50 years. Six months, you know, so. right, right. And that's what I want to piggyback on too, is like the, the global diagnosis education entire, it's a system. It's a didactic system of the best thinkers ever. So, and the, you guys have seen everything. So one of the things that you need as a dentist is high levels of predictability. Like, and these guys have skied in areas that you've never skied before. And they know where there's potential avalanches and where the good runs are and stay off of that path. Now, as a young person, you're going to go, no, I know better than you do. And then over time, you're like, no, these guys really know what they're doing. And so I want to bring us back to, you know, we are talking about like the difficult patient. This is crazy, important learning. And um, what you ultimately need is you need a system because you need that predictability. You need, you need somebody that's navigated those challenges before. So sorry to interrupt, but Bill, keep going. What's no, who, I'm dying to know what's number four. All right. Well, back to this last thing, because Jim made the key statement of the whole thing, and it's about the relationship. And obviously, I've left a lot out in this specific patient I'm talking about or one or two. There's a lot of discussion goes on. This doesn't happen in one appointment. 
And my experience has been that generally by the time it's required for me to write a check, the relationship is ruined. In other words, we could never come to that comfortable place where we could figure out how we could both move a little bit to the center and make this work. Generally speaking, for me, by the time I write a check, the relationship is not is not good anymore. So most of the time, I've had the ability to figure a way back out, and ultimately, we both are happy. I'm talking about the one that you never get there. So what Jim said about the relationship part is absolutely true. <clears throat> All right, so the patient, what I've found through the years is this patient that is not happy with the dentistry at the end commonly gives me a lot of hints along the way that they may be that patient. And the longer I've been at this, the more I'm paying attention. So one of the pieces of advice I would give to everybody, not just young, but everybody, you've always heard don't treat a stranger. And we yeah. learned that in oral medicine, you know, you know about their health history. I would propose to you, don't do elective, especially elective aesthetic dentistry on a patient you don't know really well. Do not ever try to sell a patient on elective cosmetic dentistry. Try to talk them out of it. Make them say to you, I understand all the downsides, but I want it anyway. That's when it's a good start and the relationship is set up appropriately. So reading red flags in a patient is the next one I will be talking about in symposium. And that is, what are the things that the patient says ahead of time along the development of your relationship that helps you to understand this may be the one that you don't want to get involved with? And Jim is a master at this. I mean, he has figured this out better than me. Right. Because when you take these on, I'm guessing it becomes your dentistry and not their dentistry when it's right. your idea. You really want them to want it way more than you do, essentially. Right. For sure. I get such a kick out of hearing, um, you know, the Internet dentist, the Instagram dentist talk about how they sell cosmetic dentistry. And it is foolhardy, as far as I'm concerned, uh, to try to sell a patient on anything that they don't need functionally. I'll try to sell a patient on something they need functionally, like a sleep study. I'm going to get on them. I'm going to try to sell them on that but I'm not going to sell them on porcelain veneers because they can do just fine for the rest of their lives without a bunch of porcelain on their front teeth. <clears throat> Very true. Very true. Jim, anything you'd say to that? Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, and, and you reflected back on it beautifully, Bill, about not treating a stranger. Dr. Pank used to say that all the time. And, and, and it was, and it's something that you're, you're the only times that I've had difficulty with a patient one patient who threatened to sue me about a, about an extraction that went south did all the right things that was a patient i didn't have a relationship with and and it's a very disturbing problem L luckily it happened a long time ago but you never forget it when somebody threatens you you know it, it's it's disturbing and finally you, you just have to kind of get it behind you and settle it and move on you know and and, and but it was somebody I, I had to learn that lesson the hard way it was somebody that I didn't have a relationship with. It was a common problem after the extraction. And they just, you know, they, they just were unreasonable. And I shouldn't have, I never should have treated that person. And, and it was a hard lesson to learn. Uh, it's okay to say no. You're not obligated to treat everyone that walks into your office. And certainly you have, what you are ob obligated to do is to take the time to understand their problem and their needs and, and try to see if, if there's something you can do to help. Yeah. Another thing to remember too, you are legally required to finish dentistry once you started too. So that's another thing to consider in every state. So like before you get, do anything, make sure you know them. Bill, what's number five? All right. So the next one is the dishonest patient. And that's the one that came in ahead of time with the premise that they were going to walk out with free dentistry. And I've had very little of this in my career, but I've got one that I'll be sharing. And I'm convinced that this woman came in and she got a bunch of nice dentistry done by me. And at the end, she found an excuse um, not to like a very small piece of it. And before I had an opportunity to fix that small piece, which is actually a little acrylic partial replacing two little missing front teeth, before I could redo that little flipper to make things better, she had already gone to another dentist and she was already contacting an attorney. 
So in my belief system, this woman was just dishonest. And I don't really know how to figure out who that patient is because dishonest people are commonly clever and they have probably done this before and they'll probably do it again. So it's a small subset, but it's one that you have to be willing to accept. And then you have to decide how you're going to deal with it. Are you going to fight with them or are you going to write the check? So yeah. that's the, that's the fifth one is the dishonest one. And that's, I think a very small part of what we deal with. And the final one that I'm going to talk about is actually two patients, but it's the same issue. And that's not setting expectations correctly. And I'm going to talk about the last two patients I'm going to talk about are one that I did not set the expectations correctly. And we actually parted friends, but it cost me a ton of money, not because I had to write a check, because I wasted so much time making provisionals over and over again for this patient, because it wasn't clear ahead of time what the expectations were from me and from her. And the final patient is one that came just recently. And we did get expectations set correctly. And it shows how she ended up different than the patient that I did not set the expectations correctly. So in a nutshell, that's what I'm going to be talking about at Symposium. Well, I, I will tell you, like, those are some of the most powerful lessons you'll ever learn because you're, you go into this profession with a good heart, a good head. And it's these things that take your stomach lining away that make you question yourself, you know, and, and make it not as much fun. And I, I do want to talk about this now. I'm, I'm so excited about the global diagnosis education symposium. I want you guys to talk about the vision behind it. You labeled it. Why not me? What's going to happen if I'm listening? Why do I need to come to this? I know why you got, why somebody has got to come in, but I want you guys to describe what's going to happen and why should somebody come? Well, we've got, we've got a, a, a great lineup of speakers, you know, and I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about Bill and you and Brian Schroeder and Elaine Halley that are going to talk about, you know, the, the, keys to moving from a single tooth model or, or a, a, a volume model sometimes into the interdisciplinary space. And so the question is, if we can do it, why not you? And we're going to talk, and like Bill is, is saying so, or, so beautifully that here are some circumstances that sometimes get in our way, that, that present barriers and challenges for us. But he's overcome them. And, and I'm going to talk about personal barriers and challenges that, that we have to overcome. The confidence barrier that we have, the perfectionist barrier that we have, the attachment we have to things that aren't that important that we get caught up in that keep us from becoming our best self and our best practice. And so I, I, our goal is to have people come there, um, meet us, have a wonderful experience and be able to go home feeling confident and secure maybe a little unsettled because that's good too, challenged, but having a, a, a mindset that I can do this too. Well, if all these folks have been successful with all the challenges that they've, they've, they've uh, uh, conquered and, and, and at least faced throughout their, their careers, not always conquered, uh, well, then why not me? Why can't I do this as well? And that's, that's the crux of global diagnosis the entire platform is our, our, our mission is to help implement the knowledge that we have gained in order to have uh, the, the most successful practice as we see success, as, as you personally see your own success. And yeah. this, is a, this is an outgrowth of that. And it's so cool. You don't have to be an elitist dentist to learn from this. You can start anywhere. And, I, and Bill, I'd love for you to talk about Brian's presentation and how important that is to dentists that are listening and what that's all about too. So Brian Schroeder has been a friend of mine for more than 30, probably 40 years actually. And uh, if I had to pick out the very best general dentist that I've ever been around, it's Brian Schroeder. Um, he's, he's like six, five or six, six. His hands are as big as my feet. And yet he can do the most beautiful dentistry literally of anybody I've ever been around. And Brian started off as a very talented general dentist who did a lot of his own everything. And he's going to be talking about one of my favorite presentations of all time. Anybody, certainly my favorite of his, 
and it's called Confessions of a Former Single Tooth Dentist. And he talks about his evolution from trying to be everything to a patient to realizing he needed to be more comprehensive in his thinking, but he needed to use his specialist more. And he's going to talk not only about the technical side of which he's a master, but he's also gonna talk about the behavioral side also. So this is one of my favorite lectures of all time. And we're so blessed to have Brian come and give it. We're also going to have some wonderful social events too. So this is gonna be a lot of fun as well as a, a lot of growth time. And also uh, it's open to anybody. You don't have to be a member of the GDE community to come to this. We would hope after you spend two days with us, you would want to join the GDA community, but that's certainly not a requirement. So we're opening this up to all dentists that want to come and move in the direction that global diagnosis could help lead them. Yeah. And I'm just going to highly encourage you guys to do that. Now, I invited these guys. I didn't invite them. I made them come here. So in uh, downtown Milwaukee, which is real near, near and dear to our heart, if you guys have ever been here, we be, built a state-of-the-art education space, uh, second to none. And so it's been so fun to bring these small groups in. And this is a powerful group. So if you're listening, you're like, gosh, I just need, I need a little fire in my belly. I need something that gets me excited. I need to be around a group of people that are going to pull me forward. This is an awesome opportunity. I'm just going to encourage you to check it out on September 9th and 10th. And like these guys said, you're going to see all of that, but you're going to see people that are in the process, people further down the road. And uh, it's really cool to not be the smartest person in the room, which I am often, well, I never am the smartest person in the room. And, uh, and, it, and you learn so much in that whole time. We're also going to present an operating system that you can plug right into your practice. And I guarantee you, if you use what's presented that day, you will have the best year of your life in practice. You'll be able to apply the global diagnosis principles easier and make you're practicing your life better. So I'm going to encourage you guys to check it out. One more thing. If you're listening to the podcast and you're driving or you're cutting the grass and you're not taking notes, don't worry. We're taking notes for you. Our writers are writing all this up. So everything we've mentioned, just flip up to the show notes in Stitcher, iTunes, Spotify, whatever. Everything that these great individuals have mentioned is going to be down there. You're going to see links to it. You can, if you're thinking about joining it, you can click there. You also see links to global diagnosis education. Just press the link. It's going to take you directly there and you can see all that information in there. So I am so grateful to call you my, my friends. I'm just so excited to chat with you guys. And uh, I can't wait to see you in a couple of weeks. Any last thoughts before we uh, say goodbye to everybody? I'll well, just thank how grateful we are to you, Kirk, for, um, you know, for giving us opportunity to share our thoughts, but, but also for what you've done in dentistry in general, and especially what you did, the COVID relief, what you did is you created a community. And I know the 2,500 people sometimes on one, one of the podcasts, that group of people that were there for 10 weeks will never forget those 10 weeks in their lives. Because what you did is you gave us an opportunity to come together in community when we were all scared and lonesome and create this community of caring and knowledge. Um, it's a time I'll always remember. So I'm very grateful to our friendship, but also to your vision of putting that together for all of us. Hey, well, I wasn't alone on that. I needed you as bad as you probably needed me and you coined the whole thing. We used your phrase, when we can't be together, we can still be together, you know? So, uh, or something like that. I'm like, oh, we're totally running with that. So, Bill, any, uh, Jim, any last thoughts? Uh, just, uh, just, just a, a, an immense amount of gratitude um, to you, Kirk. Again, you know, like uh, I won't repeat what Bill said, but you know, we'll we'll never forget that. And tens of thousands of dentists will never forget that. It was one of the most challenging times of our lives, but it taught us a lot, and it taught us a lot about being able to establish communities of support and friendship and how much friendship and relationships matter. That's how, that's how we live our best lives. And I can't wait to see you in a few weeks. God bless Absolutely. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys. You guys are so kind. And I'll leave you guys that are listening with one last thought. This is an incredibly noble profession. If you're in it long enough, you're going to look back and go, what a great group of people committed 
to the right things. And so I just wish you a wonderful journey. So make sure you guys check it out. And, um, you know, like I said, if you enjoyed today, just do us a favor, you know, click those links, share the episode with your friends. And until we see you guys next time, keep watching or keep listening to the best practices show. You guys enjoy your day. Thanks. Thanks everybody.